Richard Weimer uh, to give uh, another talk. Uh, for those who just turned up today, Bruce gave a talk yesterday. Uh, Bruce is going to be talking about the uh, white bellied seagull um, in Farmer Forest. Thanks, Keith. Uh, yeah, this is a project uh, monitoring the breeding of white-bellied seagulls in the Barmer Miller Forest. The project was initiated in 2005 and it was identified by the ICON site managers that it would be a valuable monitoring project. However, it doesn't uh, meet the uh, TLM general monitoring guidelines, so it's a, an external sort of project but still recognised as a, a very important uh, project to you know, fully understand the e ecosystem. And there's also a, obviously a high degree of community interest in this project because of the iconic um, nature of the bird. So when we started the project in 2005, it was pretty obvious that we needed to get a bit of a handle on the biology of the species so we could tailor our message around that, our method around that. So just a, a, a quick uh, overview of the biology of the species. Uh, by the way, all the photos in this presentation were taken as part of this project, so there's no external photos here. The species is rare in Victoria. There's only supposed to be about 100 breeding pairs thought to survive, and loss of nesting sites is suspected to be the main cause of the decline over time. The species has been identified as sensitive to disturbance and they'll abandon nests as a result. Uh, it's, as I mentioned before, it's obviously an iconic species. The adult is very striking in appearance and stands out. And one of the beauties of this project from a uh, monitoring the adult perspective is that there's no uh, possibility of confusing the bird with any other species. So it, it's great from that perspective. The, the bird feeds mainly on aquatic animals, uh, such as fish and turtles. It'll also prey on birds, including eggs and chicks, so that when you've got a particularly a colonial waterbird breeding event occurring, it's, uh, it's a great source of food for the, uh, for the adults. The uh, birds will also feed on carcasses, and just uh, lifespan, they've been known to live up to 26 years in the wild. The, the birds form pairs for life, once they've paired up, they generally uh, stay in the same location, they don't move. Once their home range is established, they can have several nests within a territory and adjacent pairs generally nest greater than 10 kilometres apart. So look, based on that information, we, we tailored our methodology around that. Actually, it's a bit more, I just realised. <laughs> the, the nests uh, generally are in tall, live or dead trees, and obviously river red gum is the main species in Barma Milloy. This is an example of a nest tree at Moore Lake. Uh, the nest's constructed of sticks lined with leaves. It can be used for many years. That's a close-up of the same nest tree, or nest. Uh, they can grow to enormous size with age as more material is added. And the other thing is that the nests are generally near water or sources of water. The, the wetland could be dry at the time, In this, uh, such as this photo here. This is the same uh, location of that Mora Lake nest tree. It's, it's right on the edge of Mora Lake, you know, only about 30 metres from the, the margin. And when that Mora Lake's full, obviously it goes right out, or when it's flooding, it goes right out underneath the base of the tree. Uh, breeding generally begins between May and October. The young fledge at about 10 weeks. Uh, I'll just quickly go through the, the age classes of the birds and, and what they look like, because that was important from our perspective. We needed to know what we were looking at. The juvenile birds are quite different to the adults, as you can see there. They're, they're you know, generally brown in colour. And here's a couple of juveniles in flight over Barmer Lake. As you can see, they're, they're very distinctive looking compared to the, uh, to the adults. The young ones stay with the parents for up to four months and then they disperse and they're often driven away by the parents. And then the juveniles slowly change to resemble adults in a patchwork manner. And there's a photo of an immature uh, roosting above Moira Creek in 2010. Uh, 
I suppose the juveniles and the immatures, there, there is a, a potential, they could be confused with wedgies. So based on that knowledge of the biology, we, our, our method was pretty straightforward. We wanted to conduct ground surveys of the nest trees that we know of, or knew of back then, during the breeding period to try to monitor the degree and type of, of, of uh, sea eagle activity. And we thought it was important as well to collect info on all sightings throughout the forest, not just in the vicinity of the, of the nest trees. Staff are not totally dedicated to the project and we haven't got dedicated funding either, so the sightings tend to be a little bit opportunistic and also reliant on the goodwill of members of the public and other people. All right, some key findings. Based on our knowledge, there's a map of what we think are the known territories of the birds within the Barmer Miller Forest. I'm not sure if I mentioned earlier, but we believe there's only seven adult pairs throughout the whole forest, and there's the rough uh, mapping of where those territories are, those thick red lines. The numbers, which you may or may not be able to read, refer to locations of successful breeding at nest trees that we are aware of and the numbers refer to how many times those nest trees have been used since the monitoring has begun. I'll just quickly go through some of our main findings. They're in no particular order or, or order of importance. And it's a bit of a scattergun approach. We'll see how we go. Look, the breeding, we've had breeding within the same season at two nests in close proximity to each other and that has indicated distinct adjacent territories quite close and the bottom left hand corner of the forest you can see the Barmer Lake territory on the right and the Mora Lake territory on the left. That is obviously different to, to our previous knowledge we thought uh, you know, roughly a 10 kilometre um, boundary for the territory. Those nest trees there are only t I think uh, 2, 3.2 kilometres apart so that confounded our, um, our original understanding of the territory size. And those two nests are the only two nests where we've had breeding detected on more than one occasion over the last seven years. We've located two instances of breeding initiated during the environmental water delivery that's occurred over that period. We've had some nests that have been damaged in windstorms, which we can't do anything about, obviously. We unfortunately had one nest tree that was burnt down in a wildfire. That was at uh, reed beds in Millowa. Many nest trees are still still to be found. We, we've known that there's been a nest tree in the vicinity because we've been able to identify juvenile birds hanging around a certain location, but we haven't been able to pin down some of those nest trees, so that's a, a work in progress. Uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, parents do not always use the same nests in subsequent years. Every time we've had breeding, the breeding has always been associated with the adjacent water body holding water throughout nesting and fledging. That can be a static water body such as a wetland or it can be the uh, adjacent to the Murray River or actually the nest tree at the Narrows has actually got the Murray River flowing right underneath it. We've had three juveniles in the one nest. We've had pretty good recruitment since the beginning of monitoring. We've had 26 young have, uh, have fledged in seven years. We, the, the information on all the sightings, not just related to the nest trees, has been valuable. For instance, we've been able to determine that two and three year old immature birds are still persisting in the forest, which means that the adults are able to tolerate the fact that the immature birds are still within their territory. They haven't kicked them right out of the forest. So when they reach maturity though, you would imagine, full maturity, you would imagine that they'd then have to move somewhere else. We've had one instance of mortality of a juvenile bird and we suspect that might have been due to um, secondary poisoning, possibly from eating a um, poisoned ibis. We thought that nesting is generally disturbed, or, or breeding is generally disturbed by human activity, but the nest at the Narrows, which has fishing boats going up and down underneath it every day and the Kingfisher crews going up and down and actually stopping at that nest tree and looking up at them nearly every time they uh, go past 
has indicated that the adults, those two adults, are quite used to human activity, and that human activity will not um, prevent them from breeding, which has been good. Uh, we've had virtually no activity in the large tract of forest upstream of Yilama, so that's this territory here, the what we call the Tongalong area, Tongalong territory. Uh, we haven't had any sightings of birds in that territory until, interestingly, uh, December 2011, when six birds were observed at a reuse dam right on the edge of the forest. So that, that was quite a surprising result. And they were of different ages, obviously. You wouldn't get eight adults together. Uh, probably the most significant sighting we had was a congregation of up to eight birds observed at Moira Lake for a week in May 2010 and that coincided with a the event of the, the Moira Lake was drained and as a result of that draining a lot of carp were stranded in the Moira Creek and the plentiful seed source obviously you know the, the birds just they all went there so um, they didn't, they weren't too concerned about the fact that there were other adults. There was, I think, four different age classes of birds there, from juveniles right through to adults. So, you know, that was a, an amazing, uh, an amazing phenomenon to see that. This does coincide with other findings that people have found where you get a drought or lack of food or an abundance of food at a point source where you can get this congregation of birds of varying age, ages. Just in summary, a few of the, the issues relating to this project. Mo monitoring can be particularly difficult in times of flood due to the inaccessibility of the, uh, a lot of the nest trees, as you can probably well imagine. It's often difficult to allocate a territory to an individual sighting, we've, we've found, because some of the borders are, are very um, ill-defined. Because we've got so few individuals in the forest, each sighting is quite significant. However, because of the low sample size and data set, we really can't apply any statistical analysis yet to any of the findings that we've got. In summary, uh, by using an iconic and much loved species, the project's been successful in galvanising a lot of community interest in the forest and involvement towards a common goal. I think the confirmed breeding during the EWA delivery a couple of times is a very positive biological outcome for EWA and can be promoted as such in a wider audience. It's still a very young project. The knowledge is building slowly, but you know we have produced some surprising results. I think probably from a threat perspective, because there's so few nest trees, probably the main threat is from wildfire or fuel reduction burning. And as I mentioned before, we've already lost one tree from, from wildfire. Finally, just like to acknowledge all staff and volunteer time on the project. And um, light bulb went off in my head this morning, Keith, when I realised that probably a lot of these, a lot of researchers in this room, are not familiar with this project, and they could have been feeding in some of the, their sightings to me over the last six years. So uh, we're back to ground zero today, and from now on, um, all the researchers, if they can feed in findings to me, that would be much appreciated. All right, thank you.